jump into it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, uh, says this, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Let's pray. God, I recognize that a lot of things have gone well today and a lot of things have taken off in a bad direction. But would you speak to hearts and minds today? God, would you speak through me? And God, would you recall in my mind things that I need to recall that I haven't written down? And would you help me to cast off things that don't need to be said for the sake of what we need to hear? In him I pray, amen. amen. So, I'm going to briefly recap because today is our final week in this. So when we get to verse 13, verse 13 here, it says, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Um, if you look at our world today and don't see evil, uh, I assure you, your eyes are not open. Uh, if you look at the fact that truth is being thrown to the wayside so that everybody can believe whatever they want and we think we're all going to get along because truth doesn't matter. Listen, we live in a time that is evil. You can look in the global, you can look in the local, you can look on the national. We have an evil problem in our world. And so what Paul is doing here in Ephesians is he's saying, listen, in the time of evil, which, by the way, is going to happen until Jesus comes back. Yep. This is what we're doing every day, putting on the whole armor of God. And then when he says, then after the battle, you will be standing firm. You have to remember that he is talking about warfare in a biblical time frame where the person who was standing was the person who won. When he says that what after the battle, after everything has taken place, you will still be standing firm. Listen, I shared about this in pre-service prayer. The last week and a half, it was not just a sickness battle that I endured. It was a mental battle. There was so much to it, but I am still standing. Listen. Listen, and I'm not just standing physically. I'm telling you, I'm still standing. I still woke up, <clears throat> still spent time in prayer. Did I miss a few days of Bible reading because I couldn't actually focus on a page? Yeah, I did. And then I got back into it. Why? Because I believe that if we put on the whole armor of God, we will be able to stand firm in the time of evil. And church, I assure you that in this day and age, we need to be resilient as the church. That doesn't mean we go out and throw up our postcards and signs and bash what the world is doing, but instead we say, I will not bow to the things of this world. I will not change because Jesus is alive and he has given me an opportunity to live and therefore I will live differently in this evil age. Okay. So then we covered different parts of the body of armor. We talked about the belt of truth and how truth holds everything together in our life. We talked about the body armor of God's righteousness, that it, it helped us understand that we are not the ones who have to endure any accusation from the devil because we are seen as righteous because when God looks at us, he sees Jesus if we have given him our life. So we are made right through Jesus. And then we talked about the shoes of peace. And we talked about how in the, in the 
soldiers' uniform, these, these shoes were like cleats that dug into the ground so that when they were in literal hand-to-hand physical combat, they could plant themselves. And this is what peace does to us, right? Peace says that in the midst of anything that's thrown at me, I can still stand firm and not lose ground. And what happens when we don't have peace is we end up falling back, right? But at some point, we have to take hold and say, no, I'm not giving up another step because I know who my Savior is and Jesus Christ is in control and he is at work and I'm going to believe in his promises that he will fulfill every plan and purpose that he has over my life and that as I have devoted myself to him, that he will work all things out for my good. So I have peace in that. So the enemy might try to throw more at me, but I'm not giving in. And we talked about the shield of faith and how it would put out fiery arrows. You see, back in that day, they would shoot literal flaming arrows. So you would see these fireballs flying through the sky at the front of an arrow. But what the Roman soldier did was they would take their shield and they would dunk it and soak it in water. So that when a flaming arrow came, not only would the shield protect them from the point of the arrow, but the shield itself would extinguish the flame. You see, a lot of times, it's not the first hit that gets you, but it's the resounding effects from that hit, right? You ever find that in life, you can take a blunt, uh, how do I say this? I'll I'll put it this way. It's, It's a lot easier for me to prepare for a defensive lineman coming right at me, actually, that wouldn't make sense because that would be illegal. It's a lot easier for me as a defensive lineman to see an offensive lineman coming right at me versus a pulling guard that I don't expect, right? A guard coming across the line, I'm looking in front of me, and this guard, some of you are like, what is he talking about? Too bad. This is what happens. And the man in the room, it's Father's Day, so deal with it. So, So the guard comes, and he takes you back. He just hits you in the side and you're just blindsided. See, this is why the shield is important because what the shield of faith does is it shows you that you're not only in the correct battle defending yourself from attacks, but it's also helping you protect your blind side. Oh, that's good. All right, now let's dive into our next piece of armor that we haven't gotten to today. So today we're, we're beginning with the helmet of salvation the helmet of salvation. And one of the things that we have to understand about the the helmet, and again, just to recap why we're talking about the armor of God, you're like, I don't understand where this comes from. Paul is in prison. He's, He's basically connected. He's tied to a Roman soldier. So he sees this garb and he's writing as a, as a metaphor uh, to Christians, to followers of Jesus to help them understand what they need to do in battle. And so he sees this Roman soldier and he says, Hey, we need to put on the helmet of salvation. And there's, a, there's a lot of important things that we can pull from this. One of them being is that you have been made secure in your salvation so the enemy has no right to question it. Any of you ever been tempted by the devil to believe that you're not saved? Right? No, we throw on the helmet of salvation because Ephesians 2, 8 says this, for it is by grace we are saved through faith and it is the gift of God, not from yourselves. You see, the the thing when we put on the helmet of salvation, we're saying, listen, my salvation wasn't something I earned. My salvation wasn't something that I took. My salvation was something that I received because it was a gift from God himself. And I believe in faith that he died on a cross, that he forgave me of my sins, and now he's given me his spirit so that I can live for him. So I've been made righteous, I've been made free, and there is nothing that the enemy can do to cause me to question where I will end up the day that I die. There is nothing that the enemy can do to cause me to think my sins have not been forgiven because you have put on the helmet of salvation and you have been made secure through Jesus and his work. The other thing we have to understand is that the helmet of salvation was not only designed to uh, resist, helmets were not designed to resist just small attacks, but large uh, large attacks as well. A helmet could take a hit from a sword and stand firm, and the person live. 
because we are short of our salvation um, because of Jesus and what he's done. Understand, that's what the armor of God is all about. The armor of God is understanding that it's not you who's defending, it's not you who's working, but instead it's Jesus and what he's done. What is it? I mean, if I wanted to make it simple for you, it's put on Jesus every day. It's allow him to transform your mind, your heart, your outlook, your perspective. And what will take place is you will be in the right battles, but you will be in a battle, but you will be able to stand firm because of Jesus. So what we have to understand, though, is if Jesus can forgive me of my sins, which is why I put on the helmet of salvation, understand also that The helmet signifies authority. Because you could look at a helmet and go, I know what rank that soldier is. I know what army that soldier is a part of. When you throw on the helmet of salvation, you are signifying that you are a part of the family of God, that you are a child of the risen king. And so what that means is, yes, you have already been saved from your sins, but it assures you that you can be saved from your current circumstances as well. That means the financial situation you're in. If Jesus can save you from your sins, he can save you from your debt. If Jesus can save you from your sins, he can save you from your diagnosis. <clears throat> if Jesus can save you from your sins, he can save your marriage. Now listen, we live in an evil age, so things aren't always going to go perfectly, right? I'm not here to preach and tell you that everything's going to be fluffy and everything's going to end up perfect. Why? Because there is an enemy who is bent on destroying your life. And not everything falls upon you and your trust in Jesus because there are other people who don't trust in Jesus and sometimes they're going to do some wicked things. But what Jesus says in John 10.10 10 is the thief comes, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came so that you may have life and have it to the full. And so when we, when we put on the helmet of salvation, what we're saying is, The enemy may come to steal, he may come to kill, he may come to destroy, but he's going to recognize that I'm a child of Jesus. And therefore, he's going to have to recognize that he's not battling me, he's battling Jesus. That's what the armor of God does. The armor of God takes the battle out of your hands. All right. Again, the enemy may have said something like, you aren't going to heaven. It's a lie. If you've given your life to Jesus, if you have faith that he has died on a cross and forgiven you of your sins, and now he sits on the throne and he has given you his spirit, which he has if you've done these other things, your salvation is assured. You might have thoughts of, you are garbage, you are nothing. No, 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 no. See, you're a child of the king. You throw on his helmet. You're part of his army. You are not nothing. Now, you were nothing, but guess what? You aren't anymore. You aren't anymore. Why? Because of Jesus. The other thing many of you might try to say, to say to you is that you have no relationship with God. Look at yourself. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen, first of all, if you start to have that thought, I'm going to say two things. One, it might be conviction of get your act together right? Okay. It might be a conviction from the Holy Spirit saying, hey, why haven't you been reading your Bible? Why haven't you been praying? <clears throat> if you sense to yourself, man, I have no relationship with God right now, and you haven't been praying and you haven't been reading your Bible, well, guess what? You don't have a relationship with God right now. Fix it. Okay. Which we're going to go into that in just a minute. The other side to that is you have been praying, you have been seeking God, you have been, you know, you have been doing these things. And then the enemy tries to say, you don't have a relationship with God. Well, that's a, that's a load of hooey. It's a bunch of garbage. So you toss it to the side. You put on your helmet of salvation and you say, no, 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 no. I'm a child of the king. I have authority because of who he is, because he has authority. All right. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. If you can see it, it's not your enemy. If you're unaware of your current battle, you're probably losing. I've been saying that the last few weeks that I have been here, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. If you can see it, it's not your enemy. If you are unaware of your current battle, you're probably losing. 
Some of you are like, well, life is comfortable right now. Everything's going fine. How's your prayer time? How's the time in the Word? Because one of the things I've learned early on in my life, I'm only 32. I'll be 33 here in, oh gosh, two weeks. <clears throat> one of the things I've learned is that when I tend to get complacent and I'm not spending time in the Word and I'm not spending time in prayer as I should, would you believe that the enemy will let me go for a period of time yeah. and everything will be perfect? And then out of nowhere, something hits and everything falls apart and I wasn't ready for it. Why? Because the enemy's smart. He's intelligent. And you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but instead against rulers and authorities of darkness. And he is smart enough to let you think that you're okay to destroy you when you're not. Okay. So up until this point, when talking about the armor of God, what we've been doing is we've been talking about defensive pieces of equipment. Now, yeah, you can use the shield as an offensive piece of equipment, and many soldiers did, but mainly it's used as defense. Okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to dive into offensive weapons, and the first one is what? The sword of the Spirit. <clears throat> Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of of God, the Bible is your offensive weapon when fighting the enemy. I'm going to say it one more time. The word of God is your offensive weapon when you are fighting with the enemy. You see, it's not a quality quote or statement from some person that holds authority. Listen, I love leadership. I love quotes. I love things that sound good. I love things that rhyme and make sense. I, I, I love that. But I'm here to tell you that the word of God is your offensive weapon when fighting the enemy. So if I cannot attach a scripture reference to my thought, I assure you the enemy is not scared by it. I'm going to say it one more time. If you cannot attach a scripture reference to your thought, to your declaration, I assure you that the enemy is not intimidated by it. Because the word of God is your offensive weapon. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We read this scripture and we go, yeah, the word of God is alive. Like it, it changes me, it transforms me. But what we're reading right here in Ephesians 6, throw that verse back up for a minute, Jacob. What we're reading in Ephesians 6 is that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And here we're reading in Hebrews that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. See, the word of God works on a level that is unseen. You see, we hear quotes and we hear statements and we go, man, that sounds good. <clears throat> and we think, man, I got to remember that. If it doesn't have a scripture reference, it's not working beyond the natural realm. Because the word of God is alive and active. And it is your offensive weapon against the enemy. See, the problem all too often when we are in a battle is that we don't know the word of God. Uh, studies recently in the last 10 years, at one point the study was, um, oh my gosh, I think it was 22%. I think it was 22% or, or less. I know it was not more than 22% because I know it was less than one in five. 22% uh, of Christians, who, people who confess to be Christians, uh, open their Bible more than, less than once a week. Whatever you would, however you would phrase that. One in five. One in five. That's it. I would argue it's probably similar. Now, I believe that there's an awakening taking place within the church and that more and more people are diving into the word, which is great. We need more. Why? Because we live in an evil age and the enemy is doing all he can to divide the church 
and to destroy the church, to destroy you. And I assure you that you can stand firm really long, but unless you're fighting back with the word of God and the promises of God, you're fighting a losing battle. The enemy will not wear himself out on you, but he can be destroyed. For we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You see, there is authority in the scriptures and there is authority in Jesus. So when we fight and when we face circumstances from the devil that he is trying to destroy you mentally, relationally, whatever it may be, I assure you, Stand your ground, put on the body armor of righteousness, put on the helmet of salvation, plant your feet with the shoes of peace, take up the shield of faith, but also wield your sword. But you can't wield your sword if you never pick up your sword. I, uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite movies growing up was uh, Disney's Sword in the Stone. And I just remember this little cartoon character kid pulling the sword out of the stone. And you see, him, you see him wield it, but the moment he gets it out, it's like impossible for him to hold. Why? Because he's never welded before. But as he grows and as he continues to wield his sword, he'll get stronger with it, right? You see, the problem all too often is we, we encounter the word of God and we wield it maybe for the first time, and we go, man, this is difficult. I don't understand it. I don't get it. And so we kind of lay it down. Anybody been there before? <clears throat> you need to keep practicing. <laughs> now, here's, here's some things I can encourage you with. Um, if you tried to wield the sword in the Old Testament, uh, move to the new if it was too hard for you. Uh, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to <laughs> study and wield the promises of God found in the New Testament than they are in the Old. Now, I'm not saying reject the Old Testament, but I'm saying start in the New. Start, listen, you want to be, if, if you're fresh, fresh, like people will say things like, uh, you know, read the Gospels. I encourage you read a Gospel, but I would encourage you read a Gospel and an epistle at the same time, because Paul does a great job, and all the epistles really, I mean, Peter, they help you understand how to live in this day and age. And they're just very direct with how they write it. So yeah, read a gospel. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John as you learn about Jesus and, and what he did as he walked this earth and the authority that he had and what he did in his death and resurrection. But also, read an epistle because it will transform your life. Because what the epistles are basically there for is to, they're written to the church to explain to them Jesus and what he's done in their life. That's what they're there for. So, that's what, that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, the other encouragement I would do, tell you is continue to come back um, because there's a, I'll, I'll say this, it's like a humble brag, but like if there's one thing that I could compliment it on more than anything, more than anything, is I actually understand what you're saying in my preaching. That's like the number one compliment I get. I actually understand what you're saying. Great. That's what I want to hear because that's actually what I try to do. I'm not trying to preach over your heads. I want to preach each week so that somebody who's never heard of Jesus and somebody who's been following Jesus for 70 years both walk away with something from the scriptures. That's my goal every week. In case you didn't know that, that's the goal. But here's the deal. If all you encounter with the word of God is what you hear on a Sunday morning, I assure you it's not enough. It's not enough. So take up the sword of the Spirit. If you can't, you can't fight with it, if you don't know it. Um, I probably should have copied more, but if you're like, you know, I, what are some promises? There is a sheet of paper in Pursuit Corner that's just front and back. It's just scripture references for different seasons of life. Um, you can buy promises from God uh, books. Just look online. Just type in promises from God scriptures. You can find plenty of things like this. You can just begin memorizing these little scripture references that can transform how you battle the enemy when you're facing difficult seasons and situations. So, <clears throat> in the spiritual world, we hold back the enemy before the path of the Okay. 
Oh, one of the things that, yeah, there you go. Remember that too. In spiritual warfare, we can hold back the enemy before he advances by declaring the word of God over our circumstances and then continue to push him back further. Uh, One of the things we talked about in this series was that we must resist the enemy. All too often, we just resist temptation, but we are commanded by God to resist the enemy. It's one thing to say, I will not do that. It's another thing to say, enemy, I see you trying to tell me to do that. And I'm telling you, get out of my face, get out of my mind. We're done here. And then you declare Jesus over the situation. You say, Jesus, would you come and would you consume my thought and would you consume my heart and would you banish the enemy from my life in this moment? That's what you do. Why? Because we don't just resist temptation. We resist the enemy and he will flee. That's what the scriptures say. Resist the enemy and he will flee. Uh, Scriptures are authoritative and powerful. The word of God is alive. It transforms us. Okay, verse 18. Verse 18 says this. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Okay. Did you know, in case you didn't know this, this was said last week as well. Um, uh, verses and chapters did not exist when the Bible was written. They're there now so that we can quickly recall it, um, which is a huge blessing. We are indebted to the men who did this, for real. Like, it is, it has transformed the scriptures for us as believers, because now we can recall scripture like that, because we can pick out a verse and know what it says. But what this says in verse 18 Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You see, all too often, when we are reading about the armor of God, or maybe when you're, uh, maybe you've been taught the armor of God, and we read sort of the Spirit, and we kind of just cap it right there. And we go, that's the armor of God, because in our minds, we think, well, that's the end of the metaphor, Um, But if you continue to read there in verse 18, when you read stay alert and be persistent, I'm pretty sure the metaphor has continued. The metaphor of the armor of God hasn't ended at the sword of the spirit. It has continued. So when you read pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. What Paul is doing is he's saying, hey, not only is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, your offensive weapon, but prayer is part of your artillery. Ooh, yeah. Ooh I use the word artillery, Bob. I kill, I'm killing it today. COVID brain what? No. Um, Father's Day joke what? Um, now here, here, here it comes up again in this series. And if you haven't noticed, uh, your pastor loves... And we'll continue to focus on the importance of prayer. Um, I believe that revival takes place when people pray. I believe that life change takes place when people pray. I believe that if we're ever going to see our life reach its fullest potential, it will only come through prayer in our personal life. If the only time that you're spending focused on Jesus in prayer is in church, you're not praying enough. If the only time you spend in prayer is before a meal and you're willing to not, if you're, listen, if you're willing to wait 20 minutes for your meal to cool down, I mean, that's on you. But uh, when I pray before a meal, my meal prayers are like 10 seconds. My kids are like five. Um, God bless this food. Amen. He's got it covered. Uh, guess what? That's not the only time we pray. So when it's not the only time you pray, you can, you can pray. Uh, Shorter prayers. Why? Because I'm constantly praying. But, again, then there are people who will pray for an extended period of time before a meal. That's cool too. But what I'm here to tell you is that no matter how often you pray, you could pray more. And you'll go, I don't know. You could pray more. You live in America. You could pray more. Um, I'm, just, I'm just telling you right now. So when we, when we talk about uh, prayer, I feel like a lot of times what can happen is we we read this and we also see that phrase there that can kind of throw people off where it says pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. And so we go, "Ah, I don't know if I want to put this into this category because I don't know if I want to address what in the spirit 
means. Well, guess what? We're going to address it today. Um, but the issue is that when we're talking about prayer, uh, it's being tied with the sword. It's being tied with the Word of God, uh, which is an encouragement to us, because if you ever think, I don't know what to pray, pray the Scriptures. Pray the promises of God. God, I believe that your word is true, and this is what you have said in your word, so I ask that it would be fulfilled in my life. Amen. Like, really that easy? That easy. Yep. <laughs> and guess what? That's a very powerful prayer because the authority of the scriptures in the prayer. So when we read uh, this pray in the spirit, one of the things that we have to recognize and understand is that the phrase in the Spirit, there's, I'm not going to dive into this fully, and this is one of those series I'm going to be doing here in the next month or two, is we're going we're to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in our life, and we're going to talk about, uh, we're not going to go into gifts, we're just going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, but when we read the phrase in the Spirit, what does this mean? So this can mean a lot of different things. Just be real honest. It can mean a lot of different things. Sometimes in the spirit means when I sit down to pray, I don't just sit down and just start speaking. But I actually allow God to speak to me. And then I begin to speak and pray that. Um, so what do I mean by that? That means that it's very easy for me to come into prayer and say, God, I want this, 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 and this. Okay, and I feel like this is where we all begin in prayer. We just begin with our, I don't want to say wish list, but it's just a prayer, right? We just, God, we want to see this happen. It's, it's another thing to come into prayer and say, God, you, you see what's happening here. Would you, would you speak to me in this moment and help me to pray over this situation? And then you just sit there. Some of you are like, what do you mean just sit there? Yes, I know it's weird in America to sit still and shut your mouth for a period of time because we want everybody to listen to us, including God. But I assure you, you were given two ears for a reason and you were given a heart to hear what God has to speak to you. So shut your mouth, shut your mind off as best as you can and ask God to speak and allow him to speak and then respond to it because he may just shock you with what he says. Now, will God ever say anything counter to his word, as in against his word? No, he won't. So if you're like, what am I hearing right now? This isn't what I thought I believed. Well, guess what? It's not. Just reject it and continue to ask God to speak. That's one part of praying in spirit. Another part of praying in spirit is if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and this is something we will cover. Again, I'm saying this. We will cover here in the next few weeks. I'm not going to talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit in five minutes. It's way too much there. But baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is what we would believe here in the assembly of God that, <clears throat> how do I even get into this? This is really hard. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where he consumes you. Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues, which is what we find in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19. And then we have been given a prayer language which some of you go, well, like, this, when you, if you know Pentecostal churches, you think this is the tongues thing. This is, this is the weird part that I don't understand. This is what we're going to talk about, okay? Now, this is, I'm going to be real here. This is where it gets real fun. Gift of tongues must always be followed by interpretation. That's over here. This is not what I'm talking about today, okay? It's different. This is gift. This is corporate. This is church body. This is the edification of the body. This is for growth of the body over here. Okay, this is 1 Corinthians 12. Over here, baptism in the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. And one of the things I'll do when I'm talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit is also explain to you uh, why some people believe different. Okay, I will explain that because I think it's important for us to know both sides so that we further believe what we believe. Okay, so on this side, we have baptism in the Holy Spirit, prayer language, which for some people, prayer language is a foreign language that they didn't know. Um, I've been in a service where somebody was praying in tongues um, in a world language that they did not know. And they did not know what they were saying. Um, I don't have that. Uh, I have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I do have a prayer language. And I do pray in that prayer language in my private prayer times. 
And in those moments, what God does is God is praying through me because I do not understand what I'm saying. Now, sometimes, I'm not going to lie to you, sometimes this Holy Spirit does speak to me and say, hey, you're praying about this in this moment. I don't understand, like, I'm not interpreting what I'm saying, okay? Some of them, that's not what I'm talking about. Again, that's gift and interpretation over here. But sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, hey, right now, you're, you're, you're praying for this, this marriage. You're praying for this sickness. Or maybe sometimes what I'll do is I will, in my head, be kind of thinking about which, by the way, it's really weird because they've done studies on people praying in tongues like this, and it activates a part of the brain that's, it's, 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 it is, it's just weird. I'm just going to be real. It's weird. It's normal, but it's weird because it's, un- it's unexplainable, but it's what happens. So anyway, what's taking place is I'll be thinking about a person or I'll be thinking about a situation, and then I'll begin praying in tongues, and I'm praying in the Spirit in that moment. Okay, so when we hear pray in the Spirit, some of you might read that and go, well, I'm not baptizing the Holy Spirit with the essential evidence of speaking in tongues. You're not off the hook. You're not off the hook. You still pray in the Spirit. You pray in the Spirit by allowing God to speak through you and praying it. Okay? Does it has, some of you go, this is over my head. But has at least some of this made sense to you? Yes. If not, that's fine. Um, keep coming, and I'll explain it more another day. Uh, worship team, can you come on up? So when we're talking about the Word of God, we're talking about defensive, we're talking about offensive. We're talking, I don't want to focus on defensive because I spent a lot of time on that two weeks ago, but I am here to tell you today that oftentimes when we are walking through difficult situations, we don't take the time to fight back. And it's time that we begin to fight back. It's time that we begin to declare the promises of God over our situations over our lives and we resist the devil and he will flee from us so this morning we're going to sing a song and we're still we're doing well on time we're going to sing a song here in your presence and as you sing this song i encourage encourage you encourage you to ask God to speak to you. Because when we, when we sing these songs, I'm going to switch my mics because... Here we go. So when we sing these songs, which I encourage you to sing them, even if you begin singing them quietly. But when we sing these songs, what we're doing is we're... These, a lot of times... These are scripturally, well, for us, because I'm the pastor of this church, um, we're not singing songs if they're not scripturally based. And so we sing, sing things like, God, in your hands there is joy. And in your presence, fear is gone. God, in, in when I spend time with you, everything that I've earned in my life, they fade away. And so, God, I just surrender it all in the midst of who you are. So, God, in your presence, I'm undone. I'm weak. God, in your presence, we get a glimpse of heaven here on this earth. God, in your presence, situations and circumstances and battles are transformed, they're made new, and I've been made new. So God, I choose to bow before you because you're wonderful. God, you're beautiful, you're glorious, and you're matchless in every possible way. So we're going to sing this song. My encouragement is make it personal. Sing the song with your current circumstance in mind. With that child, with that spouse, with with that bank account, (laughs) with that diagnosis. Believing that in the presence of Jesus, things change. As we put on the armor, and declare his promises, things change. So 
if you need to stand, if you need to sit, if you need to come before this altar, do what you need to do to encounter Jesus this morning.